Welcome everybody to Wisdom from Our Neighborhood uh, for May 12th, 2020. Um, this is the, uh, the, the webinar and the podcast of Paths to Understanding, formerly the Tracy Levine Center and Neighbors in Faith. Our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. And today I'm, I'm really happy to have two, uh, two incredible leaders in Washington State, Elise DeGuer, who's the co-director, and, and Paul Benz, the, the Reverend Paul Benz, who is also the co-director of the Faith Action Network. Um, Elise brings to FAN three decades of experience in mission-driven work in human services and advocacy, a lifelong resident of Washington State, born and raised in Yakima, completing undergraduate education at Spokane at Gonzaga University and making Seattle home since the 1980s. Elise, thanks for joining us. You bet. And then uh, the Reverend Paul Benz, is an ordained minister of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. He served as the director of the Lutheran Public Policy Office of Washington, previous to his role at the Faith Action Network. Paul has been a longtime social justice leader in Washington State's religious community on numerous issues, and he continues to advocate for FAN's legislative agenda in Olympia. Paul, thanks for being here. Great. Yeah, thanks, Terry. So uh, we, we've been doing this each week during COVID-19, just a, a brief check-in about how your families are doing and how you're coping with uh, COVID-19 and the whole thing. Uh, Paul, how's it, how's it been for you all? Well, um, thanks, Terry. You know, I've, the phrase I've used um, is uh, everything has changed, but nothing has changed. And uh, uh, at least for me, that, that is uh, holding so true that um, um, the, uh, the great human need um, that we, that has always been, in our midst um, has has just spiked, and um, it is uh, deeply troubling for all of us uh, who care about humankind, and um, and we are at Fan are trying to do what we can right uh, in terms of advocating for that need in the halls of power. So um, you know we we just ended this legislative session uh, on March 12th and and COVID-19 was already at the doorstep. So, yeah. uh, but uh, I'll just say very honestly, as, as, uh, as, as a white man, I am as, you know, um, am doing quite fine. But yeah. I know my neighbors, many of my neighbors are not. Yeah. Elise, how about you? How would you respond to how your family's doing? My immediate family is doing quite well. Um, we have a college age student that just finished his uh, sophomore year online, which was an interesting process. And uh, my husband actually drives elders, um, fragile elders to uh, appointments. So they've seen a lot of need. Um, but I've been really, really encouraged to see how creative faith communities have been at this time, and I think they were among the first to say, we got to continue our mission. Uh, how can we do that? And that's been encouraging to me in the midst of a whole lot of need. Yeah, and so um, I just want all, all of our viewers and listeners to, to know that if you want to ask a question of Paul and Elise as we go along, if you're on Facebook, uh, please feel free to comment, and, and uh, um, Ian will make sure that I, I, get, I get notification of that. If you're on Zoom, please use the Q&A feature there toward the bottom of your window, and we'll be happy to engage those questions as, as our uh, conversation continues. So I'd be really interested to, to let people know about the work of FAN, uh, what you all do for those that might not know too much about it. I can start there. Um, we are a statewide interfaith advocacy and social justice organization. We have been um, together as FAN for nine years, um, just coming up on our ninth birthday. Uh, it was the formation of one organization out of the Washington Association of Churches, which had existed for decades, um, and the Lutheran Public Policy Office, which Paul was the director of, um, merged together and said, how, how do we move forward? Well, um, really importantly, uh, the way to move forward was as becoming an interfaith organization and knowing that we are all stronger together, that our faith traditions bring such richness and um, vitality to the work of social justice. So that's been really exciting. Um, I've only been part of it for six of those nine years, but um, that, that, that vitality 
and those uh, bridges that we've built of understanding um, and, and relationship have been essential. Um, Paul could speak to um, more about the, the origin, um, but we do our work uh, with both faith communities and with individuals. So the, the faith communities, um, we are 155 faith communities strong who have taken the pledge to work with FAN. Um, and that number continues to, to grow. Um, and about several thousand individuals across the state as well. Paul, what would you add to that? Um, you know, in, in terms of the roots and, and, the, and the vision that, that um, you know, brought Faith Action Network together, I think we, on the one hand, kept um, the social, if I could say, the social justice advocacy mission um, as, as the same. What we wanted to, so, so the name, right, Faith Action Network, but again, to the name, the distinctive um, uh, change was we all felt that we're, that those of us that were bringing FAN together at that point in time, 11 years ago, you could say 13, as it took a couple of years for us to really, you know, um, come to the consensus that yes, this is, this is what we uh, agreed to in terms of specifics. But the, but the distinction is from the past, not the social justice advocacy, that continues, but it's the interfaith uh, dimension where we felt, wow, this is, this is a bit of a Kairos type of moment. So, um, so the nomenclature, right, uh, it's not the association of churches um, or Lutheran or whatever, but it's, it's, it's faith action network so all of the family of god so to speak and this fits well into to the work that you do uh terry so well, well you know it's, it's it's so beautiful uh, what i'm hearing is so beautiful about fan is that you're not only trying to do the work of of of, of um of advocating for for social justice but you're doing it together and because you do it together that is already an incredible witness and sort of helping communities to learn um, who, who maybe have, have, haven't always reached out and worked with, with people of other traditions, you're actually modeling how we can live together in this time. And I, I just have always so appreciated that about, about the work of FAN. You know, there's a lot of people out there, and here's a question I didn't send to you, you know, who say, well, what does faith have to do with legislation? I mean, why should, you know, what do faith communities have to do with that? I mean, how do you respond to people who say, you know, faith communities should just stick in their buildings and be quiet and maybe have a potluck once in a while, but not care about legislation. I mean, how do you respond to that? Well, we know that each of our faith traditions speak to our care for neighbor, um, our welcoming our neighbors and, and the people most in need among us. And our faith communities do that really well um, by opening the door and being the hands of compassion and and charity, but they also, part of their calling is to um, change why the people are coming to their doors, to look at the systemic issues. Um, and, you know, all of our sacred scriptures speak to that really profoundly. But um, so we, we take that core of beliefs and, and put them into action. And who makes, who, who creates those systemic situations, but um, governments and policies that, you know, I, I guess personally, I would just say coming from decades of working in social services, where we were making the shelter space, we were opening the doors of the food banks. Um, we were so busy, there was often not time to do the advocacy. And more and more, it, you know, my eyes opened and saw as many people in faith communities eyes open and say, when we change one law, we can feed tens of thousands of people instead of just um, the important charity towards neighbor as well. So. Yeah, Paul, how about you? What do you, how do you respond to that question? When people I, ask it? I, I, I don't know that I can add much more um, than, than what Elise said, Terry. I mean, it's, it is truly a, um, 
a call uh, that we know that is rooted in, e in each of our religious traditions, right? E each in, in different ways. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I just can't help but think of, 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 of the force of, of Gandhi. And, and, it, and we all know that, yes, Gandhi was front and center, but he, you know, it, it, it wouldn't have been a movement if it was just one person, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and we know that's so true. And so I think what, what a leader does is instills in, in everybody that, yeah, that's right. You know, um, uh, we can, as, as a particular faith community, whatever the name of that faith community is, take care of our neighbors that we see around us, but we can do so much more together. And, and that we should go to uh, upstream, upriver, um, and not just take care of the, of the, quote, drowning bodies that we see going by us, but asking the question, you know, where is the source of, of, of the problems? Um, and, and obviously, our, our structures, our systems is, is a part of that. And that right. we can solve right. it together. You know, Lutherans mm -hmm. going to an office, Roman Catholics going to an office, that's, that, that's all great, Sikhs, no matter what it is. But when all of those come together and meet with the decision makers, wow, that's, that's, that's makes a big, I think, a, a, even a bigger impact. Yeah, so, there, so that together you're able to, to kind of bring a, a moral clarity, kind of a moral voice that comes out of, out of many different communities that can then begin to impact the, the very systems and, and the structures that 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 create the some of the injustices we see toward individuals and toward neighborhoods, and I just think that is just so incredibly powerful. So how how do you all engage 155 faith communities uh, to come up with some some legislative uh, goals for your work every year? How do you do that? Well, it's a process, as you can imagine. Um, yeah. You know, there are issues that our founding organizations plus FAN in nine years have um, been known to work on. And then there are the issues that individuals bring or faith communities bring. If you're in an agricultural area, you're gonna bring some different issues than the urban areas. Um, so we take all that input and we do it by meeting with people, by um, gathering people throughout the year in different um, formulations. Right now it's springtime and we go to four different regions um, and have summits with people from those faith communities that are part of our network and then just individuals whose faith community or may not have made the choice to join or who aren't part of a faith community, people of conscience um, fit into who advocates with us as well. So we go to those meetings and we say, here's what happened in the legislature. What do you want to talk about? What's pressing for you? And we're really eager to begin those this Sunday um, in the Vancouver area to say, what's COVID-19 been like here? What new needs have surfaced? So so that's this season of four summits, um, Vancouver, Puget Sound area, Yakima, and Spokane. And then in the fall, um, we try to gather people into in their clusters, which are smaller neighborhood geographical groups. Um, 155 faith communities divided into 21 clusters. Try to get out there and talk in smaller groups. And, and in those meetings, people are able to say, well, we have you know, the shelter effort going on, um, but we can't cover, you know, two nights of the week, you know, could your, could your faith community open its doors, things like that. Um, and all the way along, people are saying, but I wish FAN would work on, you know, the environment um, or climate change or climate justice, um, things. So they offer us input that way. Um, and then a couple other times during the year, we gather people in meetings with interim, interim meetings with legislators, um, both during the summer and fall in candidate forums, which is something 
the communities can do is host a candidate forum as long as all candidates are invited. Um, we gather with our whole network in a big celebration in November, which is our fundraiser, but also kind of a celebration of everything we've done together. And then um, ultimately during the legislative session that runs January through April, January through March, depending on which year it is, um, we gather people to advocate right in the halls of the Capitol, meet with their um, legislators, talk about what's on the top of their mind on the issues that they care about. Um, we also gather people in Spokane and Yakima who might not be able to travel to Olympia to talk about the issues and find ways to advocate together. That's the overarching. Paul will add some detail to that. Paul, you're uh, you're muted for us, brother. I'm 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 in an office space here where we get uh, other things brewing, and I didn't want that. Uh, but um, okay. um, I think the only thing I'd add to that, uh, Jerry, is that um, uh, fans' tagline. Faith Action Network, a partnership for the common good. So I just want to just say just a couple words about the partnership. So in terms of because your question, I think was basically, you know, geez, how do you come up with with a, uh, a legislative congressional agenda type of thing? So another source of that is that fan alone, much less a individual denomination or faith group, um, you know, it, maybe if we were a multi-million dollar operation, we, we could, right? But um, we are much stronger when we work, at, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a greater coalition. So uh, FAN has uh, dozens, literally dozens, dozens of, of community partners, uh, policy partners, um, from labor, from the human services sector, from the environmental sector, um, uh, you, you name it, um, and we we are meeting with them, and and again that is a part of our tradition, right? That's not just something that fan created. That was a part of how we operate here um, in Washington State in the social justice uh, religious community, intersecting with our quote secular uh, partners, right, uh, for the common good. So I so I'm imagining that when you when you get all this information from all these people of faith and the, the term that we tend to use uh, now for faith communities is wisdom communities mm -hmm. because then that that can easily include um atheists and agnostics and and, and other humanist traditions uh, so you gather people together from different wisdom communities and they all kind of out of their shared values are proposing um ideas issues that are that they're seeing in their own community and then you're also in conversation with these other partners who are also gathering some of this information. And then you're, are you also like checking in with legislators to see the things that they're hearing and kind of discerning in the middle of that what's possible? Um, you know, and what's, what, what part of the issue can you work on this year? Is that kind of part of the process that you all encounter? Yeah, I mean, if uh, the, the reason I was late to 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 our gathering is that um, I was on a call with one of one of our policy community partners um, with three state senators, and uh, so I mean, if if you want to, I mean, another phrase that we haven't used in this conversation, but it, it, it it's just right there. It just it says it without saying it. Is social change? How can we um, create? you know, uh, the common good, the, the society, the beloved community, to use a phrase from Dr. King, right? Um, and, and you don't do that by not engaging the decision makers, whether, whether they be in government, whether they be in business, uh, whatever sector of society they might be in, you need to engage those people that are making the decision. So yes, we are we are in always in groups and meetings with 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 our elected officials. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so I've been you know to advocacy day a number of times, and uh, it's really empowering because um, I, I have to say like the first time I went, you know, I'm just a small town kid. I don't know what I'm doing. I've never talked to these people before, you know. And then we we go there and we meet, you know, together and and we get some coaching from you all. 
people are kind of broken up into different groups of, of, of uh, and to kind of get more prepared to go and engage. And then we usually go and engage uh, people to get go and engage a legislator together so that you're kind of like not on the spot, but, but, but someone in that group is, is able to speak really well to that issue. And, and we all play a different role in that conversation. And I, I have to say every single time I've gone, I've been a little bit nervous um, even though I'm capable of speaking to people, right? Uh, but I've been, been kind of nervous, but it, it's, it's also amazing how those conversations seem to actually impact the legislators. And I, I've spoken to several, you know, away from the legislative session who said that those conversations really change their mind and open up new perspectives sometimes and lead them to deeper questions. And um, so, so when you all are, 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 like how many folk have you had this last year come to, to come to your advocacy day? I mean, how many folk participated? We had, we had 200 this year. Um, and that's, you know, a lower, low average. Mm -hmm. um, we missed it the year before because of snow. So we think perhaps that was part of that. Um, I think also this year it was um, not the budget year of the legislature, not the long session. So um, there was less, perhaps fewer people. That said, 200 people was wonderful, you know, and we could actually talk to each other. And um, in the height, right, um, when there were a lot of worries about how, um, how change would affect states, uh, we had 400 people. So there you have it, like from two to 400 people somewhere along those lines, there will be um, people eager to come to talk to each other and their legislators. And having missed it a year, we really realized um, people are want that connection. They're not gonna just come down on their own um, as much as if they can come down with a group and get workshops and, and coaching and walk over with people. So, uh, a lot of times uh, I've heard conversations about, should we do this differently? Not just all, it's not just a day, it's a movement, you know, um, and it is. And, and Paul always says that every IFAD gathering, we call it IFAD, Interfaith Advocacy Day, um, that this is one time you can advocate every day uh, that the legislature is open. You can advocate every day to Congress. Um, this is the time we do it together. Well, and it, it made me so much more comfortable talking to my legislator after having been there a couple times. Mm -hmm. It just shifted my my whole sense. It gave me a different sense of confidence. So um, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate um, those days. I know it takes a ton of work to put that on, but it it really it really um, it really I really felt empowered by it in a really deep way. And of course, the other fun part was having lunch with people after we talked to the legislators. <laughs> that was also really, really quite wonderful. So what were some of the legislative wins uh, that, that, that for FAN in this last session? And are there any in particular that you're excited about? Paul, how about you? Yeah, well, Terry, um, I, well, I, I, I will speak to that. I guess um, the reason I'm, I'm pausing a bit is, is COVID-19 is just, right? I mean, it's just, um, it's taken front and center for each of us. Yes, um, and uh, so uh, to go back even to March 12th seems like it's March 12th is like light years away. But yeah. let me just highlight a, a couple of things that I think um, um, and want to um, point our viewers to our website, fanwa.org, where you can see on um, our 20 to 30 uh, plus uh, bills that we were a part of, of, of passing. Mm -hmm. I think I'll just highlight um, uh, two or three in particular in terms of, of the uh, interfaith uh, racial equity uh, dynamic, if I could say it like that, and, and also our, our, our um, care for creation. So, so three real quick. Um, one would be to our immigrant community, our undocumented community. Uh, last year, we, we passed a bill called Keep Washington Working, and this year we passed um, um, through the leadership of the ACLU, which highlights one of, our, one of our community and policy partners, 
a bill called Courts Open to All. So the whole dynamic between these two bills, Keep Washington Working and Courts Open to All, is how can we protect and um, a deep, have deeper appreciation for the immigrant community, but particularly the undocumented community. Um, and, and the fight here is, is really against ICE um, um, at, the, at the federal level and making sure that their, their grip on the, um, on the structures of society in, um, with law enforcement and which was keep Washington working to separate that communication um, at the jail level, which, which leads then to deportation to the detention center in Tacoma and then uh, from there out of the country. And now the courthouse open to all is obviously the courthouse. And then there's a, a, a mile or two perimeter established in the, in the law uh, beyond the actual courthouse building. In terms of communication that happens there between federal ICE agents and prosecuting attorneys and all, all of that. So that's one bill. The second one uh, that um, I want to um, lift up is the, uh, in terms of care for creation, is asking the question, and Terry, this is applicable to you coming from, uh, like myself in, in some ways, uh, from, from farm country, and at least too from Yakima County, is what we call the Sustainable Farms and Field Program. So that basically at the very highest level, asks the agriculture community in this state, which is huge, one of our greatest economic engines, right? And, and employs people in the immigrant and undocumented community. Um, what are you doing about your carbon footprint? So it establishes and incentivizes programs for growers, producers that are already doing something along those lines to incentivize them to do even more in terms of carbon sequestration. Um, and then the uh, last one I want, want to, to close with is, is a small one, but I think such an important one for uh, our First Nations people in this state, and that is the Tribal Regalia Bill. So we're 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 in the in the time period of graduations, particularly high school graduations, college graduations, and and we know the the uh, the, the trauma, the huge impact that that's having upon those students and those families of not having the traditional ceremony. So what this law now signed by the governor will do is, is if I'm a Native, Amer a Native American uh, a young person going to a high school graduation, I don't have to hassle with the powers that be within that high school to wear my tribal regalia on the graduation ceremony day. Yeah, I'll be having a conversation. We're, we're sorry, folks, about the, 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 the Zoom noise here on the microphones. Uh, we'll just keep working through that. I'll be having a conversation with, uh, with Debbie Lekanoff tonight, um, actually at 7, 7 p.m. And so I'll, I'll be sure and give your greeting to her, um, who, yeah. was, who was the sponsor of that, of that bill. And, you know, thinking about both the, 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 the issues regarding the courts and, and how ICE was using jail and, and kind of people, uh, you know, to, 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 uh, uh, to detain people and to, and to, to deport them. You know the 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 Hebrew scripture eighteen times, as I'm sure both of you have heard, suggests that that one of the key uh, ways to express love is care for the resident alien or to care for the stranger, as it sometimes is called in the scripture, or in this case, the undocumented worker. And so um, that's a that is a key part of many wisdom traditions is that whole care for the stranger. And so um, when faith traditions see that that injustice happening and also can see that 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 injustice um, makes people less willing to contact their police departments when they're victims of a crime and it actually makes neighborhoods and communities less safe when the criminal justice system is being used in that way and so it's just such a powerful um such a powerful uh a set of legislation that's kind of helps to helps to to create that sort of safety zone so that police can actually do their job. It's uh, I'm so I'm so thankful you all were able to work on that. Um, and I, I guess I'm wondering, you know, because you you started off with COVID there, and Elise, you can you can add more to the legislative um, uh, kind of wins this last year if you wish to. But I I, I now that COVID is here, how is it going to impact? 
those legislation that legislation and what's kind of the conversation happening at the state level about how they're going to adjust their their budget i i know that today the the democrats put out the cares another cares act uh, basically um uh back in the house of representatives to talk about giving some money to states and to cities and counties and other municipalities but what are you seeing in terms of of gains that are at risk because of COVID nineteen and the whole economic situation it's created? Thanks, Mark. Elise, I'll let Paul speak to the specifics as the policy lead for us. Um, but I I do think that uh, what I've heard is coming um, is of deep deep concern. And with the econo unprecedented economic um, suffering that, that people will be experiencing, um, we know that we can't balance this um, challenge on the backs of the people who are suffering most. And we will need to say that over and over and over again. And we, as people of faith and conscience, will need to be the ones to say there's a different solution. Um, so from a just a moral um, stance, we're going to have to be real clear about that and say that in a variety of ways because the conversations have already begun. Um, having having gone through the previous recession, working in um, food insecurity and hunger work, um, we spent years digging out of those cuts that were made um, during the recession. We can't do that again. So, but more specifically, Paul, if you will. Yeah, um, yeah um, the, 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 I mean, the, the, the conversation that I just came from was, was the working families, um, uh, the, the, the working families tax credit coalition. So, um, uh, and what, what that coalition is, is about is, is what you were referencing, uh, Terry, as well, is how can we particularly uh, think about the most vulnerable in our community? Um, and one, one of those groups is, is the undocumented community that, you know, any, any unbiased uh, analysis, economic analysis, will show how much they contribute to the state and federal treasuries. Right. Um, if I and I want to use that word treasury uh, versus budget to really get the sense of 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 the the wisdom community, so to speak, and how each each person is is a treasure in terms of our society and should be treasured. Um, so that is uh, and and then a, a, a parallel effort that's going on right. I mean, when it went on today, I was not able to be on, on the on the call with the governor's staff, but is an effort to say. How can we invest in that, again, the, the immigrant undocumented community uh, for a relief fund? And because they have been left out of what we've had four or five congressional relief packages. And um, we are just now finding out what the uh, Democratic proposal will be uh, with the next uh, congressional relief package. Uh, an, another piece of that, Terry, and um, Paul knows this well, is we're going to have to figure out um, our deep, deep problem with um, our un unbalanced tax code. And to be, for Washington State to be the most regressive, the most regressive um, tax system in the nation uh, just has to be fixed this time. Uh, well, I was going to ask you about that because, you know, clearly states that are relying on sales tax for the majority of their of their state income are really going to struggle during this period because work is literally not available. And even before work was not working to adequately flow um, uh, money throughout the economy. You know, work, all the money was getting stuck at, at very high levels of income and staying there. And so, and so I, I have lots of, you know, more conservative family who are telling me, well, if people need money, they should go work. And, and then, well, for how much? And can they find those jobs? And, our, and, and during, during COVID-19, of course, um, work is not working 
to flow money through the economy. And so a lot of my conservative you know, family members are like, well, we shouldn't give money to them as if, as if the money that goes to people who are going to spend it is a black hole and never gets spent anywhere. Where we know that that actually has a multiplying effect far greater than say a tax cut. So th there's just a lot of economic theory out there that people are carrying around some economic assumptions folk are carrying that keeps them sort of you know negative about some kind of state income tax. But, but states that have income taxes are going to be less impacted, it seems to me, from what I'm reading across the country. So is there going to be any, any move, uh, kind of a, a movement, a growing movement around changing the way uh, we fund our government in the state? You know, um, there will be, um, there is conversation going on regarding that, Terry, and um, at the federal and state level. And there will continue to be great conversation about that. Unfortunately, um, I'd like to say that it, that that conversation would be more conciliatory, but it's it's going to be rife with um, the the everything has changed, but nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wish we could find a um, a a better path forward, just in terms of the conversation. But when you enter the three letter uh, word arena of tax, um, you know, right away, I, I guess what's in my mind as we're having this conversation is the word privilege. And uh, those who have been economically privileged in this uh, country and this state um, and call for austerity, uh, because that is the word that is being used a lot in terms of, of our state legislative leadership, um, they will call upon austerity, but the three of us know where that will be focused on will oftentimes be on the programs that the most vulnerable rely upon in our state. And I think what, what many of us are trying to change that conversation is to say, what about the existing privilege and how can austerity come into that community to make investments into the community that needs to rise up the economic ladder. Police, anything you wanna add? I think the reality of this conversation is this is where FANS partners come in so helpful. Um, coalition partners, people who are economists, people who have been working at budget solutions for a long time. Um, and we bring the faith voice and faith communities and people of conscience um, to those conversations. And then we take their conversations and bring those back to faith communities. So I think that is our mission to make sure um, the voice, voices of faith and conscience are at the table. Just, just a, a quick minute on that, a, a very specific point. Um, is that we are literally in the midst with the Budget and Policy Center of Washington State, which is just what Elise said, is, is, the, is the economic, um, one of the economic brain centers in our state, right? In terms of where do we go now, so to speak, uh, uh, economically? What are the economic solutions? And, um, and then we're working with the welfare anti-poverty advocates who are now calling upon the faith community, which is FAN is a part of that of that coalition. Again, one of our examples of a community policy uh, partner for the common good. Uh, so you, there will be an op-ed that we are pulling together right now, and it will be basically right signed on by uh, someone from the uh, a religious leader within the Muslim community, Jewish community, and Christian community. You know, I, I read an article today that, that said that, that about 40% of the people who received some of the checks from the CARES Act, one of the previous ones, the $1,200 check, um, um, have, are actually saving it. They're not paying down debt with it. They're not investing it. You know, they're not, they're not spending it. They're actually just saving it in their bank account. Um, which, of course, isn't exactly what that was intended to do. It was intended to keep, you know, keep flow, money flowing in the economy, which then, which then leads, leads to the question then, what about those that, that, that A, didn't get those checks, right? 
And what about those that, you know, what's going to happen for those people who, who just are not going to have a job? What happens to the self-employed? What happens to the migrant farm worker who is now out of a job? Um, we have so many people, they're going to be extremely vulnerable. And the, you know, the argument basically that I hear from a lot of people is, well, caring for the poor and marginalized is nice. But I think our wisdom traditions actually teach us that it is, it is central to us creating a healthy, thriving community that we all want to live in. It's not nice. It's essential the way education is essential. So when you're engaging in those conversations in those, in those rooms, Paul and Elise, like, how, you know, um, you know, what kind of arguments are you hearing that, that cut away at the idea of helping of, 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 of providing, you know, some, some financial sustenance to folk? I mean, what, what are you hearing from them? Please. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you know, I, I think what, what we are hearing is just what you're saying, Terry, is uh, there's, there's uh, nothing new in terms of, of I'm, I'm thinking of the, let, let's just stay right here in Washington State, yeah. uh, the, the meatpacking plants. Sure. Right? Um, you know, um, our, our Latinx neighbors in, in the Tri-Cities said, you know, by phone, you know, Walula. There's, there's a, uh, a meatpacking plant right outside of the Tri-Cities, um, in between the Tri-Cities and, and Walla Walla. Look, you know, who, who are the folks working at that plant? We, we know who the folks are working at that plant. And, um, you know, the, the, the president calling for the workers and, and the economic powers that the owners of those plants calling for those workers to go in and put their lives, talk about austerity and sacrifice, um, you know, there, there is, it's just, I, I, I don't know. It is, it is just a very, very difficult time, Terry, to, to be able, how do you have that public conversation um, when, when, when the chasm is already so great and, and you, you are trying to find a bridge over that, right? Okay, let's, can we not do what another economic engine is doing in this state? I don't know that they're doing it perfectly well, but, but at least at the Boeing plant, they're not bringing 27,000 workers back in. They're saying, all right, we've got to scale back the production of this, of this economic entity. And we can only allow so many workers back in. So I, I, it's, it's a very, um, um, and, and believe me, the, the conversations are just beginning and will continue, especially with this CARES, with, with this particular CARES Act, uh, it is going to be the most difficult one to get past um, because of the political divides that we have over over how to care for the most needy in 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 our in our country. I guess uh, and another example I would add is um, today there were three strikes at uh, fruit packing um, plants in Yakima. Uh, just caught my eye the headline and I mean there's an example of. It's in all of our interests that that food gets processed. It's in the growers' interest to talk to their workers. It's in the workers, I mean, the workers who need the security and the safety in, in a time of COVID, um, who, are, who are asking for an interim solution so that they aren't more exposed. Um, and some economic justice in terms of wages for hazard pay. And... Uh, I mean, that's just an example of what is the common good. The common good is that we have food on our tables and those dr growers know that they need those workers and um, they've, got, they've got to come to the table and, and figure it out. You know, it's been such a revealing time um, to, to listen to some of the conversation that's happening across the country. Um, you know, I've, I've thought for a long time, I've said that, you know, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, you know, none of those, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, are not the major religion of our, of our time uh, in the United States. Uh, our, our major religion is that we're producers and consumers in a free market economy that's winner take all. And that's, that's our identity. We're producers and consumers. 
and the gods are kind of the market gods. And I heard John Oliver, of course, uh, who's a great theologian in lots of ways, um, talk about uh, actively the, the, what, what some politicians are asking for is for, for the elderly, for people working in those meat processing plants and in, in fruit and in vegetable processing plants, uh, people on the front lines of grocery stores who don't, don't who get paid minimum wage to sacrifice themselves, not for the common good, but for the market gods. <laughs> and, and it's just, it's been so revealing. Uh, of course, we, we knew that that sentiment was there, but to see it expressed in such a blatant way um, is just, um, I, hope it, I hope that we can, I hope that we can take this opportunity to see the dangers of some of what we've been talking about as a country in terms of what our values are, which of course is what religious traditions are, are partly about, right? They're, they're about kind of thinking through carefully what does it mean to be human and how do we live, build community with each other and what kind of values help to guide that community. And so in this time, it's gonna be fascinating to see how faith communities can step forward you know, with, with the leadership of FAN and with, in other organizations as well and, and counter that, that kind of market-based theology. I mean, I've heard, I've heard people say that we aren't a country, we're just, a, we're just an economy. We're just a free, a free market economy. That's who we are, right? Which undercuts everything about the way our, our, our you know, constitutional democracy at its, you know, is even longing to be. Um, so I, I, I just hope, I just really am thankful for the leadership that you all are providing so folk can, can counter that with some other messaging. Sounds like a part two to this series in the fall during our election year, you know, yes. what kind of country, what kind well, of country do we want? Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, that, 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 that's a great uh, nexus, um, uh, Elise, to what Terry was saying to what we know is coming. I mean, we are in a very different time. Everything has changed, even how campaign works, right? How political campaigns yes, work. Yeah. But just in Washington State, you've got 98 House seats up. You've got a third of the state Senate up. Um, we've got, you know, we, we have the, the, the White House up this year as a country. And, and FAN always encourages and helps facilitate candidate forums. And, and faith communities, wisdom communities can take that on. And we encourage, you know, your um, uh, viewership, um, Terry, to really deeply consider that in their community. There's an election going on, you know, to ask the question, because when you sponsor a candidate's forum, guess what? You're in charge of the questions that can be asked. Um, and what kind of community do, you want, what do we want to live in? What is the beloved community? Is that... Does that even enter into our conversation anymore? So what, what can people do? What else can people do? Um, what, what else what other, can wisdom communities do uh, to, to engage in this kind of values-based conversation, you know, which, which again, um, you know, the way, um, the way love, the way we sometimes talk about love in wisdom communities, especially Christian ones, is that love is a feeling. But in the New Testament, of course, uh, love is really the willingness to risk to work for the well-being of your neighbor and, and your neighborhood, which includes you. you know, and, so, and so to engage in these kind of conversations is an act of love. So what are some of the other ways that, that the people that are listening could participate with FAN uh, to help uh, advocate for, uh, uh, for the, the kind of community we want to build? Well, I would just say that you made a nice segue to um, this season we're in right now. We've been really talking about love. Um, what have we been doing during COVID? We've been protecting ourselves and our families. Protect what you love. Um, protect the people that you have made a, an oath, a pledge to be with. Um, so that happens in public policy as well. I mean, how does a public policy protect the people you love, the people that your neighbors love? to protect the beloved community? Um, how do we make tangible change? So that's kind of a theme for us this year. Um, Rick Steves, um, our great sponsor, um, donor, said at our dinner in November, um, you know, advocacy is kind of like political love uh, 201. 
it's like taking what you love and putting it in action and with tangible out outcomes. So um, I would say uh, we talked about 155 faith communities that we work with. Doesn't mean we don't work with others. We work with anybody who wants to work with us. What's helpful is when people decide to um, join, um, then we know how to reach you. Then we know like, oh, over there in Newport, Washington, or over there in um, Okanagan is this faith community that wants to take action. And we have a phone number and a way to connect. Um, so the more that people make that joining and there's no like um, contract you sign except to care for the common good and take action together. Um, but the larger our movement grows, then we'll know how to reach out to groups and bring them together. Um, and an individual can just go to um, fanwa, F-A-N-W-A dot O-R-G and sign up for our emails and see the kinds of things that we call out and see if that calls to um, calls you to protect what you love. Um, those are two things I can think of. What else, Paul? Uh, I mean, that, that that's a lot right there, you know. Um, um, like us on, on, on Facebook. I mean, we have actions all the time that we are posting, not just what fans doing, but it gives you the, the larger picture of, of what's going on in the social justice, social change community, whether it's in our wisdom communities or in other wisdom communities, right? Terry, you know, uh, and all of our partners. So, because the more voices we have that are united, on the same page, singing off the same note as a choir, um, the more impact we'll have. So um, Fan would love to work with any of your folks in terms of in their state legislative district, in their congressional district, in their community, um, and, and find out you know, what, what, what is going on, what, what is already happening, uh, the many good things that are happening in many of our communities. Well, I just want to thank you both uh, um, and, and just shift the tone here just for a minute. I, I just, I was so grateful for the support that you that you all showed, that Fan showed for the the Faith Over Fear Roadshow that Anila Afstali and I started a couple of years ago. And without you all, we would not have had contacts all across the state. And and uh, you all were really helpful in, in so many ways in, in helping to promote that. And I, I'm just so grateful for it. And I want you to know that everywhere I go, you know, as, as I see that kind of opening, I'm encouraging people to consider reaching out to FAN and becoming part of your network um, because uh, just we're in, because some, there's something so powerful about working with other wisdom communities, other wisdom traditions and finding that we have shared values that we can, we can live out together. But I, I just kind of want to end here, which is, um, you know, what is it that gives you fire in the belly for this? You know, what is it that makes you tick around doing this kind of work? Because it's it's often very challenging and and sometimes you you get a win and sometimes you don't. Um, what what keeps you both, you know, kind of um, motivated and inspired to do this work? I'd like to start, start with you, Paul. Well, I think what, um, you know, I would maybe say um, uh, two things. Um, one would be, um, you know, um, I, I guess maybe it's about the dash, you know, <laughs> um, it, I think we each, each of us as a human being has to ask, um, what, what purpose has the, the, the creator, um, given to me and, and, um, what are the gifts that I have been given, um, and how can I utilize those for um, the greater good, uh, right? For, to, to help create the, the beloved community. And I think that's, and so that's the other thing, the, so it's, it, it's the, the dash, what, what am I doing with, with who I am? And then that's connected to uh, the greater good. You could, you know, love a neighbor, however you wanna, wanna phrase that. Um, um, that is, those are the two things that that continually come to to present to myself. And and as 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 a white man, I will just honestly say, when I look in the mirror, um, yeah. So what am I doing about that? Now, Lisa, how about you? 
I mean, I think the call of Micah to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with God is, is something that has drawn me to this work and continues to propel me forward. And I also know that there's something about the interfaith building relationships and basically relationships at the root of it that is energizing and exciting and helps us all learn new things. Like, um, you know, Terry, you and I had the experience of the Parliament of World Religions together. And, you know, what a fantastic world we live in and what wonderful wisdom traditions we have. And um, if we're not doing justice uh, that can be seen and recognized in our communities, um, you know, that's where it's at for me. You know, when I was there at the Parliament, uh, I wore my collar quite a bit. And uh, I had a rabbi that I know come up and say to me, Terry, you know, why are you wearing your collar? You know, and I, I said, well, I just think Christians need to repent in public. <laughs> you know, and as, as Martin Luther King, you know, Jr., you know, taught, um, we're not responsible for the way the world is when we're born. But we are responsible for learning about it, understanding it, and trying to make, do what we can to make it better. And, uh, and I just, I hear that call, you know, so much in both of you and just so appreciate the sense of, of, of inner drive, but also vision that, that you've been given um, that I think all wisdom traditions have, have been given to, to strive for that um, more peaceable future, um, for that more peaceful future that, that all of us long for. Um, so I just, I want to thank both of you for for being with, with me. And I look forward to doing one in the fall with you to talk about the election season and, <laughs> and some of the things as, as we're preparing for the legislative season that starts next January. And I just, I just wanna say on behalf of all of us, we so appreciate the leadership that you do that and the leadership that we don't get to see you do in those one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, by the coffee table with the legislator um, or someone from the governor's staff. Like we're so appreciative that you work on those relationships and, and I'm, I'm just so grateful um, for the work that you do. So thank you both for being with us and for everything. Well, thank you, Terry, for allowing this opportunity to happen. So, um, and for the work that you, important work that you do. Well, thank, thanks thank for you both. building bridges of understanding, really. I mean, this was a lovely conversation. It felt just like a, a conversation over coffee. So Indeed. You. It's over Zoom, but, but you know, we, you, we have some coffee. I have a coffee cup over here, so we're good. <laughs> so, so I just want everybody to know uh, that we'd love to see you next week, uh, next Tuesday. Um, we're going to have uh, the Reverend Rachel Tabor Hamilton and the Reverend Danae Ashley in conversation about how we can understand the, the impact of the stress the COVID-19 situation has brought on us, um, ways for us to cope, how to aid our recovery and that of our family and friends. You can find out more about our work at PathToUnderstanding.org. Remember that we have a really great TV show called Challenge 2.0, which is hosted by Jeff Renner. It's on Sunday mornings on, on uh, MeTV. And, uh, and it's also on our YouTube channel, the Path to Understanding YouTube channel. We're still continuing our Facts Over Fear campaign to counter anti-Muslim bigotry. Encourage you to go to www.factsoverfear.org and join that campaign. And we encourage you all to be well, be calm, and especially be good to your neighbors. Thank you all for joining us.